Hey, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. First off, I'm just excited to be in the room um, with so many fellow league members and guests. So thank you all for coming out on a, what's a beautiful um, Wednesday. Um, can one of you grab the door? Not our guest, but thank you. I got you. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. Um, I will say for those of us who are joining us um, virtually or via Zoom, um, if you have any questions for our speaker, please, please put those in the chat and we will um, share those out loud when the guest begins to answer those. For anyone who's in the room with us um, this afternoon, if you would, if you have a question, put your hand up um, and we will ask our guest speaker that as she gets a question that she repeats it out loud. So those joining us on the internet um, are going to be able to find us there. So our guest speaker today is Ellen Leroy Reed, Executive Director of the Friends of GTM Reserve, a nonprofit citizen support organization for the Guana Talamato Montanzas National, I'm going to get this part wrong, Estuarine uh, Research Reserve. It's a beautiful long name. Um, the Reserve's business, Visitor Center is in Ponte Vedra Beach, but it's a boundary of conservation lands that spans over 76,000 acres south in the Flagler County. The mission of the reserve is to protect natural biodiversity and cultural resources using a scientific approach to its research, education, and stewardship. The Friends help the reserve achieve its mission by bridging the gap in funding and resources through donations, volunteerism, and community partnerships. Before joining the Friends, Ellen served as gala director for the American Heart Association and owned the consultancy business specializing in sustainability and development for mission-based organizations, which is valuable work and I appreciate you for that. She has volunteered with US Green Building Council, Global Jacks, Navy League, American Lung Association, Habajacks, and the USO. She served as a mentor with the Community Connections and Junior Achievements uh, JAG Girls Program. She and her husband, Fred, have lived in Jacksonville for over 10 years and they have five children. Ellen will speak to us today about the GTM Research Reserve, what it is, why it was established, and how each of us can get involved. And Ellen, the Zoom floor is yours. Should just be able to. Thank you so much, Linnell. And thank you all for having me here today. Uh, normally I'm a little bit of a, a browser, but for the sake of those on the Zoom call, I'm gonna try to stay right here. Um, uh, thank you for, for having me out today to talk about GTM. Um, I realized that my first four slides were probably in the introduction, so we might be able to go through these relatively quickly. Um, but as mentioned, uh, my name is Ellen. I'm the executive director of the Friends of the GTM Reserve. So we're the nonprofit that supports the work that is being done by um, the reserve. And of course, when I hit the button, All right, we're going to use the mouse. No? Ah, there we go. We're going to use the mouse. Okay. So um, <laughs> our role is, is pretty simple. Uh, we bridge the gap when they need things. So we are truly a friend of the reserve. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about what the reserve is. Um, but I do like to, to differentiate. So we have the GTM, which is this partnership between NOAA on the federal side and DEP here in Florida, Department of Environmental Protection. So it's, it's a large organization with many reserves uh, nationwide, but we here locally help raise funds and volunteerism so and have grassroots support for the reserve itself. Now, most people know us as WANA. <laughs> right? Um, it's the G in the T and the M, uh, but there's so much more to the reserve itself. But for context, we typically say, you know, you remember Guana, Guana State Park. How many people have lived in this area for more than 10 years? Hold, hold your hands up if it's more than 20. 30? All right, we'll stop there. We're good. <laughs> Needless to say, you are familiar with what used to be Guana State Park, just south of South Ponte Vedra Beach. So about 20-ish years ago, when they were interested in forming a National Estuarine Research Reserve in Florida, that area was designated as environmentally and ecologically significant. And through a bunch of deals and contracts and moving and shaking, the NER, as we call it, came to be, which is also why we refer to ourselves as NERDs. N-E-R-R-D-S. 
Um, but many people know us from the Guana Preserve right there in the visitor center backyard because that is where our exhibit hall is. That's where our offices are located. When volunteers come to volunteer, they typically come to the visitor center and then we deploy them. Um, it's where we have 10 miles of trails, which are extraordinary. It's where we have three beautiful rustic beaches that most people don't know exist and that are open to the public. Uh, it's where students come from all over North Florida to learn about the estuary, to learn about sciences, to learn about STEM, to learn critical thinking. They do that at GTM. But we are far more than just the visitor center and far more than Guana. Uh, we are also far more than trails. We are much more than the beaches. Uh, we have an extraordinarily robust research program. That's why it's in the name. So many people who have come to Guana forever, they come to the beaches, they go to the trails. They don't realize that in that visitor center, we have a team of researchers and scientists that are working on priority issues related to um, habitat, water quality, uh, climate change issues, sea level rise. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that because it's typically what most people don't know about is the research that's happening behind the scenes. Another reason why I think that the reserve is so well supported by the community is that everything we do is based in science. So several years ago, I had a group come to me and they were really concerned about some possible development on the north end of Guana. And they said, what are you gonna do about it? I'm gonna find out what we know about that system. We're gonna find out what data has been done. We wanna see what baselines and trends were already in place. And what we discovered is that because the GTM's boundary is so massive, it's over 76,000 acres starting from South Ponte Vedra Beach all the way down into Flagler County. When the decision was made about where to do water quality testing, Guana just missed the mark. They only had the resources to do at that time four testing sites. So we're talking San Sebastian Inlet, Pellicer Creek, Pine Island. So just based on prioritization of resources, our tiny little guana system didn't make the cut. But the researchers came to me and they said, yeah, we don't know enough about guana to be able to comment on these issues. So as the friends group, I was like, okay, how much money you need? Can we get like 10,000? Like, I don't know. I was on the job six months at this point. <laughs> like, we'll see. Um, I started reaching out to our existing Friends members. The organization had been around for 16 years before I came on board. So we had a really great group of supporters already in the area. And within about three weeks, we had raised the $8,000. We're like, we'll find the other two someplace. And we just started doing water quality research. So we started doing this work in the Guana system. This was back in 2017, 2018. Since that time, now the Department of Environmental Protection is now doing water quality testing. Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has now supported that funding and taken over doing that work. And for better or for worse, through that project, it was determined that the Guana Lake and Guana River are impaired for nutrients. That doesn't sound like a good story, but what happens when we don't get on the scale? Do we lose weight? <laughs> it's never happened to me. So we know that what we don't monitor does not improve. So we knew that we had to monitor the water quality to see what was happening there so that something could happen. So when it came back as impaired, I'm pretty sure I was on a call with like 400 people when they were going over the impaired systems. And I'm like, yeah, duh, I know. <laughs> but we needed the data because that's what we do at GTM. We do not go by gut instinct. We don't assume. We also don't assume we know where those contaminants are coming from. That's where hypotheses come from. We think it is this, but we are going to test and do research to determine whether or not that is true or not. So now part of the research that we are doing at GTM is to identify the source of the pollutants that were, are coming into those systems so that we can inform decision makers so that they are acting on, they're doing the right things as opposed to doing what we think are the right things. So one of the tests that uh, we do is we test for uh, sucrose and acetaminophen. Why do you think that is? Probably human. Because as it was explained to me 
um, invasive pigs do not drink Diet Coke. <laughs> Like, that was a really good point. So, because a lot of people like, oh, no, it's just, you know, we have a really bad hog population. You know, they, they manage the system for, for uh, duck hunting. So it's probably from all of the ducks in the system that are putting that into, so we're like, okay, we need to differentiate whether or not it's potentially human or potentially animals. So when we saw the presence of sucrose and saw the presence of acetaminophen, one could deduce that it was probably human. Now, I am not a biologist, not a scientist, so it starts getting very, very complicated, but there's also a difference. Acetaminophen and sucralose get filtered out in different ways. So not only can they determine whether or not it's human or animal, but they can also determine whether or not it's from direct point source runoff or non-point runoff. So now they're able to determine whether or not it's coming through wastewater systems or it's coming from direct you know, hits to the water body. That's fascinating to me. Now, some of us took advice like, so we should not drink Diet Coke anymore? No, no, that's fine. We, we, we're not trying to get sucralose out of the system. We're trying to get high levels of nutrients out of the system. But that's some of the work that we are doing at GTM to keep an eye out for these water bodies and to also build trust in the community. Never will I say, I think we should do this unless there is a solid base of data to back it up. And often it is the role of GTM to not even make calls like that. They provide the research and the data to other scientists that then test out possible solutions. So it really is um, a group effort, which brings me to my logo soup. So how do we accomplish all this? It's 76,000 acre boundary. Uh, we, how many of you have been to Washington Oak State Park? How many of you have been to Favor Dyke State Park, Fort Matanzas, uh, Princess Place, Moses Creek? All of those places are actually included within the GTM boundary, but we only manage the Guana Preserve directly, which means that we have to work with a number of partners to make this successful. So quarterly, we get together what we call a management advisory group, where all of these partner representatives get together around a table, and we talk about issues affecting the estuary. Who's doing a prescribed burn? Are you? Do you need our help? Hey, we're conducting water quality research over here, and you probably need to know that your nutrient levels are high. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder why. So it really is a group effort. But as I said earlier, the primary partners are NOAA on the national level, and I'll talk a little bit more about how you might be able to help us out with some of these federal and state partners. Um, and then on a local level, it's the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Most of our daily operations go through DEP, like most of the people who work in that building are DEP employees. Um, and then from an operations perspective, or excuse me, um, from a, like a, an overall goals perspective, NOAA kind of guides the reserves um, on what they need to do. So, pop quiz, how many reserves do you think we have in the country? I think I've made it a little bit too small for you to read it right off the screen. I'll give you a hint, it's 30. It's 30, we actually just recently added one and we are in the process of adding two additional reserves. So I'm gonna not go into extreme detail about how the process works to become a designated reserve, but the short version is that it is the local community that decides they want one and then they work with all of these managing partners and then they submit a proposal, they try to get the governor on board and all of the state legislators on board, and then they submit their application to NOAA. Typically before that huge application goes up to NOAA, there's some, hey, can we be a reserve? And they're like, I don't know what you got going on down there. I don't know, we're pretty interesting. So there's some back and forth before that whole proposal happens, but it typically comes from the local community that recognizes that they want these places protected. So why do we want to protect estuaries. What is an estuary? It is a waterway. That's why we like our estuaries. General way of thinking about it is an estuary is where the river meets the sea. More specifically, they are chemically different water bodies coming together. So if you noticed, 
remember when I went to Lake Superior Nerf for the first time, I'm like, okay, where does the sea meet Lake Superior? <laughs> like trying to follow a river all the way in because in my mind, an estuary is where a river meets the ocean and that's where you have that brackish water. So you have that little bit salty, a little bit fresh. It's where 90% of our fisheries come to nurse is in the estuarine system because it's an area of protection. So if you like fish and shellfish, the estuaries are critical. Um, even if you don't like those things, they are critical um, economically because if our estuaries are not healthy, our communities are not healthy either. But what if you don't care about any of that stuff? I will tell you that they are protecting you even if you don't know that they are. So our reserve here, our estuary is what's called a bar built estuary. So if you look at the map, you'll see that there's that little barrier island. So it was built up about 10,000 years ago. I thought it was way longer. Like I looked at it, it's like, how, how old is the estuary? Like a billion years old? No, it was only about 10,000 years ago. So during the ice age, these estuaries came into existence. So for a lot of ways, our estuaries are kind of like young gals. They're kind of fun, kind of flirty. You know, suppose like Lake Michigan, that's a little bit older. Um, but we're also starting to see that age is starting to wear on her. And it's our job to kind of keep an eye on her. So uh, it's a lot of what we do at the reserve is we kind of act as the, the doctors and nurses that are keeping out, uh, keeping an eye out for the estuary, monitoring her vitals, uh, taking care of her, keeping her clean, um, because she's done a lot for us and continues to do a lot for us. Uh, we're just learning more about the filtration that the estuary does, not only the water itself, the estuary serving as a sponge and absorbing all of the stormwater runoff, but also we have a robust oyster population. So if you look out at low tide out onto the Guana uh, Peninsula, you're like what are those rocks? Those rocks are oysters and they are both ecologically and economically and culturally important to this area. Oysters also filter a ton of pollutants out of the water. So as we were measuring the pollutants that were hitting Guana Lake, we saw that as the water moved through the system, it was becoming cleaner. And then when it hit the dam, it got dirty again. So the oysters and the bivalves in the system were starting to do their job. But we are currently doing a research project uh, called, I think it's called Guana Nuts. Yeah, Guana Nutrients, Budgets, and Bivalves to determine how, how much of the pollutants can the oyster populations handle. Like right now, most people won't, won't eat oysters out of the guana system. Why do you think that is? Because they're absorbing a lot of pollutants. Because we're asking them to do a lot, right? There's so much nutrients going in. Essentially, you know, Ponte Vedra drains into the guana lake. So in a lot of ways, the guana lake is acting as a wastewater treatment system for Ponte Vedra Beach. So we're working a lot with um, community members in Ponte Vedra to recognize that though you may not live right on the lake or you may not you know, visit it on a daily, you may not fish from it, your activities in the North End are having an impact on that water body. And right now it's struggling to keep up. It is impaired. So we have to kind of be mindful of that. Especially those who were so passionate about studying the water, like they gave their money and their time to go out there and do this. So now what can we do as community stakeholders to go back to our decision makers to say, okay, we proved that it's impaired. What they need to do is determine what's called a TMDL, total maximum daily load. So this is a process that you have to go through to say, we cannot put more than this much nutrients into this water body. And then there is a basin management action plan, a BMAP. So these are all done on a state and local level and it says that over a course of this much time, we must reduce the nutrients in the system by this much. For me, that was the goal of us funding that water quality projects, to then be able to go back to our council members and say, okay, we knew, now we have the data to back it up. Now it's on the impaired water body list for the state of Florida. Now you must take action to do something. So as the League of Women Voters, I'm going to plant that seed with you is that that's one thing that we need our community to do. You don't need to know what a TMDL is. You don't need to know what a BMAP is. You don't need to know what the nutrient levels are. All you need to do is go to your representative and say, it's impaired, fix it. Well, I don't know how to fix it. You need to find the people to fix it. This is important to us as a community. 
So we have a handful of priorities. These are the things that we do at GTM. And I've already talked about a couple of these. I've talked about the water quality and watersheds. I've talked about the aquatic life, our oysters, our plankton, our fish communities. Um, we are also studying, it's called habitat mapping and change analysis. What do you think that means? What do you think that's code for? Climate change. We are seeing significant differences in our estuarine system based on sea level rise and climate change. I didn't think I would see that in my short seven years at the reserve, but since I started seven years ago, we used to have this little Menorcan well out at the end of our yellow trail. When I started seven years ago, you could walk to the other side of the well. Now the well has been completely enveloped by the Talamata River. Mostly erosion, um, boat wakes. When the boats come through, they hit the side and they're washing it away. So I may not necessarily be able to say that it's specifically sea level rise because there are also other issues at hand, but we are starting to see changes in the water levels and it hasn't been that long. Um, our former director has been with the reserve for 20 years. He's like, oh no, I can show you maps. Like, it's moving much faster than we, we anticipated. So we don't talk about whether sea level rise is happening. We're talking about what we're gonna do because it's happening. Um, another impact of that is the work we're doing with marshes and mangroves. How many of you just love the way it looks out on the estuary because of those beautiful salt marshes, those pretty spartina grasses out there? Um, I'm from South Florida. I grew up with mangroves. That was our ecology, these beautiful, strong mangroves that served the same role. They protected us from storm surge. Uh, when I came on board seven years ago, the northernmost mangrove was south of us around Daytona. The northernmost mangrove is now in Georgia. So mangroves are migrating up the coast. And our researchers have kind of been like, well, I mean, is that good or bad? Because mangroves are stronger. They can withstand a lot more than the salt marshes can. But what happens if we have a freeze, and the mangroves die, and the mangroves have replaced the salt marsh, and now we have nothing? That's a concern. So our research are, are simulating what that would look like by warming chambers around certain mangroves to see how it changes the benthos, all of the mud, all of the tiny little particulates. So there's a lot of work that's going on there in addition to the public use of the system, protecting our cultural resources and just managing the preserve in general. I am not gonna read all of this to you, but sometimes I just put slides in to go, huh, we got a lot going on. So these are a few of the research projects that we are working on currently. If you notice, most of them have to do with marsh systems, those nutrients that I was talking about. Um, we're looking at how the nutrients in the water um, are hitting into barriers. So this roots and rakes project. I'd never heard of a rake before the friends actually funded this project. So rakes are buildup of oyster shell along the coastline. And some would say, oh, well, that's good because it's gonna keep the um, erosion from happening. But also the rakes become solid and the water can't get through them anymore. So now it can't clean out the nutrients. So we're studying the impacts of these, uh, these rate systems. Um, we're also making sure that all of our science is accessible. Uh, all, most of, all of the research that we do is available to anyone. You can go to our website and click on the link and see our water quality data every 15 minutes for the last 15 years. If that is something you're interested in, it's free available, freely available in the community. Um, this is something that I'm really proud of. We actually have a third uh, photo to add to this. Uh, the Friends have been funding a graduate research fellowship for the past three, four years now um, to help raise up the next generation of scientists. We provide uh, their tuition, stipends, any obstacles they have um, to working with us, we provide all of that funding um, and it's something we're really excited about. Mention a little bit about accessibility and inclusivity. Uh, back when we had our 20th anniversary, which now was four-ish years ago, we're trying to come up with a theme. Our mission is to protect natural biodiversity and cultural resources using science, right? So we're like, well, what's the theme? Well, it should be biodiversity because we know that biodiversity creates a healthier ecosystem. So couldn't it also stand to reason that diversity creates healthier communities? 
And we looked around our reserve and realized that we were not doing a good job of making our reserve fully accessible and fully inclusive. So from that, we created the GTM for All initiative where we just tackled everything we could. We tried to tackle mobility issues, uh, hearing issues. Do you want to go ahead? No, okay. I'm down for more people. Um, sorry, for those on the call, we had somebody come up to the door. Um, so we created this initiative where we tackled as many issues as we could. So from that, we have had autism sensitivity training. Uh, we have made our building uh, more accessible for not only students with autism, people with autism, but um, people with PTSD issues. We have safe, quiet spaces for them. Um, we have bought a these water quality testing monitors that read out the data to you. So if you can't clearly see it, I have to tell you, like, I was like, oh, that would be great for our students from FSDB that come out. Um, I, I also need to use them now because that data is very small. So it has really come to help so many people. I think we were talking about this earlier. When we started tackling the issue of accessibility and inclusivity, it helped everyone, even those who did not identify from those particular communities. So we're trying to make these spaces accessible for everyone. Um, and it's, it's it's beginning to work. We still have a lot more work to do um, because we tried to tackle it all at once, as you would. Um, but it's now been woven into the fabric of who we are as a reserve. It's no longer this independent program that you're going to handle diversity, OK? Let us know what you come up with. It's the task of everyone in the building. How are we reaching out to interns? Are we ensuring that we are reaching populations that uh, are good for our organization, but maybe have transportation issues? Are we reaching out to universities that may have been difficult to reach out to before and we just stop because it's way too hard? Like, so we're really pushing our boundaries to try to reach communities that we otherwise have not had success in. And I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing there. Um, culturally, we saw, um, we didn't know what was going on in our own backyard. You know, I remember the aha moment I had when I walked over to the Guana Dam and there was one of the historical signs that said, uh, what was it, I can't remember, Grant's Plantation. I walked by it a thousand times and I really never connected. I'm like, oh my gosh, we had a plantation here. What does that mean? What do we not know about the people who lived on this peninsula, mostly alone? for the late, the last two decades of the 1700s. You know, if you go back and read through what was happening at Grand's Plantation, the Indigo Plantation in the late 1700s, there was um, one person appointed by the governor, Governor Grant, to oversee the Indigo Plantation. And then everyone else on the peninsula were enslaved Africans. So much of our culture was built from the footprint of what we now know as the Gullah Geechee people. So we're in conversations with the Gullah Geechee Nation, um, the Gullah Geechee um, Historic Corridor to become included in that because there is this footprint that so many don't know about. If you go to it Michaelers and A1A, kind of, I'll be right back, I promise. This, you can see it on the screen. Uh, but if you look at Mount Pleasant, it's right here. That's Michaelers in Palm Valley. So there were, there were enslaved people's homes right there. So we're now searching for where were the cemeteries? Like where should we be looking for uh, culturally significant artifacts from people and how do we recognize their history in a way that is meaningful and important and tells the true story, not just kind of what we thought was the true story. So this is something in progress and very exciting. This is one of those slides where I'm like, I just put this together to look to see all the stuff that we do. So everything that we didn't talk about is right there. That's crazy. So um, if anyone is interested in volunteering, I think we had, I see you. Um, these are some of the things that you can get involved with either as a volunteer or just to enjoy. Like this reserve belongs to you. I'm happy to send this PowerPoint out to you if you wanna pour through it. I usually bring hangouts, but it's been a terrible week. Um, but if volunteering is not your jam, you just want to know what you can do to help your reserve, I'm gonna give you some just quick ones. One, plant natives get rid of invasives. It seems like an easy thing to do, but invasives 
take over these natural areas. And what did I say our mission was? Biodiversity. A biodiverse system is healthy. When you have invasives with no natural predators, they come in and take over and they, they mess up that balance. Um, make sure that you're watering and fertilizing responsibly, because even if you're not directly on the water, as we mentioned, the impact that we have on the watershed reaches down throughout and touches um, your water bodies. My mom was stunned to find out that there was a creek behind her house because she had never gone that far out. It's like, mom, like, you could see it. <laughs> like it's, it's right there. But we just don't know. If we don't have a natural connection to the water, we may not make that connection on our own. We cannot ask a better group than this, but please advocate for your waterways. You don't need to be an expert. As a matter of fact, as you know better than anyone, you get a little suspicious when you know too much. Is this, is this self-serving? No, I just, I'm a member of the community. I need you to know that these places are important and you need to protect them. Um, be a good neighbor to your native wildlife. Who hates snakes? Okay, that's a relief. Um, when I came to the reserve, I hated snakes. I have since changed my mind. I will never have them as a pet. They still startle me in the garden, but I respect them and I need them to be there. I give them their space, they give me mine, we're good. Um, but don't leave out trash. Don't make an environment that will harm an alligator. Like just, it's never an animal's fault when you have an animal encounter. It's probably us. So just be a good neighbor to the native wildlife. Um, and then I got to put in a plug for our sea turtles. If you go to the beach and your kids like to dig up sandcastles, fill it, flatten it, because nothing is more devastating when our sea turtle patrol comes out in the morning and there are dead hatchlings in holes that were dug by other people. It's tragic, it's not okay. So these are a couple of things that you can do immediately to, to help out. Um, I always make um, a plea for volunteers. I'll tell you, we have a great group of volunteers. We have fun. If you wanna give one hour a year or a hundred hours a year, we have an opportunity for you. We are grateful for every minute you give us. I would not be the executive director of the Friends of the GTM Reserve if I had not asked you to be a member. So please know that all of your contributions stay here locally and support everything that you just saw on this screen. Um, or at the very least, come by and visit us. My offices are right there in the exhibit hall. It's a little sign on a door. I'd be happy to give you the behind the scenes tour. So thank you so much for your time here today. I know I spoke over what I was supposed to. So um, if there is time for questions, put it out there. So Carol asked about the development that was um, happening on net road that kind of prompted um, us to do the water, water quality project. Yeah, it is my understanding that it has been put on hold. Um, it is also my understanding that the deed for the property had been transferred to someone else that was not gate property, but I am not a developer land person. So I don't know that I know all of what that means. But I will say that the push to develop the land slowed significantly. Um, I, we cannot take credit for that as a friends group. I think that very passionate people who we did work with. So when they came to me, some of my greatest friends now are the ones that came in like, what are you gonna do about it? It's like, we're gonna do some science. We're gonna get right back to you. Um, they're volunteers at GTM. You know, they, we talk on a daily basis because they have a role to play in the community. We help fund the science and the monitoring to protect the place. And when there are concerns, we then work with our community members like the Matanzas Riverkeeper to say, okay, here's the situation. Here's what we found. Now you do what you do so well. So as far as I understand, Carol, it has been kind of on a permanent hold. Any other questions? Yes. So the question is about if you see an invasive plant, report it to, you ready? I usually bring a handout for this. I've got one, I-V-E-G-O-T-1. It's, it's an app. 
I would find out more information and send that out to you because that, yeah, because that's something that's real important. Also, there's an app called iNaturalist, which is one of my favorites, especially for us um, novice naturalists. You just go out, you take a picture with your phone, and then you push a thing that says, can you find something that looks like this? And it helps you identify things in the wild. So I've learned so much more about our natural spaces using iNaturalist, and you can save it. And it is used, it's a citizen science program. So if people are looking for things like beach vitex, when you put it into your phone on iNaturalist as well, it alerts um, certain organizations that are watching out for those sorts of things. Thank you for your question. No, that is it. I've got one. That's it. And it actually comes up the flip side of these. Uh, and I think that it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not necessarily fair to expect people who move to a community to know the subtle nuances of what is considered an invasive and a native in your area. So one of the things that our collaboration team at GTM is working on is um, it's a terrible working title, but welcome to the neighborhood because we're nerds. <laughs> work in progress because I think only we know that we're nerds, but we're gonna we're gonna workshop it um, as a handout for people who are just moving to this community. And we're going to work with real estate agents to say, hey, just include this. It gives you some helpful tips and tricks on how to live in this coastal ecosystem. And the real estate agents have been very responsive to it because it's an added value that they can give their, um, their clients. So that'll be exciting. Is this not their fault? Like, I don't know what I didn't know when I moved to Florida. Now I know better. And now I do better. Any other questions? Uh, air potatoes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about fish? So, like, we don't have lionfish, as far as I tell. Like, lionfish are always the ones that people talk about a lot in Florida. So, one of the fun things about having that collaborative team at GTM, those management advisory groups, when we get together, it's a lot of the topic of conversation. Like, somebody at Fort Matanzas the other day, they're like, "Did I hear somebody spotted lionfish?" So it, it's, it prompts a conversation. Um, I can tell you some of the invasive animals that we definitely have. We have an invasive hog problem. Uh, they are uncontrollable and they destroy our marshes. Uh, so we have a team of people that go out and actually take them out in a very humane way. But we also have a partnership with um, some of the uh, wildlife rehabbers. So the people who do birds of prey rehab. So we're able to take that meat to them. So, you know, I, I know that hunting is a very divisive topic, um, but if we don't manage the invasive hog population, we will not have populations of other animals and plants. So this is our solution to that problem and it's all science-based, but we also try to use what we have in a positive way that helps other animals the best way we know possible. Um, we also have human animals. I don't know if you notice the, you know, well, I've always called them lizards since I was a kid. Uh, you have the brown ones. Now, Green anoles can turn brown under stress. Again, I'm not a wildlife biologist, so I know maybe this much more, probably this much less than a lot of people here in the room. Um, but the Cuban anoles are pushing the green anoles out of the population. You normally only see green anoles up real high because the Cuban anoles run everything below. So if you see a green, protect it, make sure that it's safe. Um, the Cuban anoles, mm, do with it what you will. <laughs> Let your cat play with it. I don't know. That's your decisions to make. Um, but yeah, so we do have some invasive animals. We have not seen pythons in this area. Oh, there's the Cuban tree frog. Thank you so much. So yes, we do have a team. Our stewardship coordinators, in collaboration with our researchers, do what's called um, uh, reptile and herpetology monitoring. So you'll see these like PVC pipes throughout our trail system. And they're designed to kind of like trap these little frogs, skinks, you know, just small amphibians in there so that they measure to see what's out there in the community. And since they've been doing this, they've actually discovered one that they did not think was in the reserve boundary for like the last 30 years. So it's really exciting, the monitoring work that they're doing. And we wouldn't know if we didn't have a team of researchers that are like, this is important. I saw you had your hand up in the back. Did you have a question?
So is that cane frogs? So there's a question um, or a comment. Oh, yeah. So there was um, a frog in South Florida, a cane frog that um, when like animals would lick it, it would have like a toxin that they put out. I am not familiar with whether or not they are in this area, um, but I can ask around. I know they See, and that's where it starts, like, especially when you have changes in your climate. So people are stunned to find out that we have a pretty robust roseate spoonbill population. That's just, I love roseate spoonbills. They're so weird and they're so pretty and so weird. I think they should be the state bird of Florida, but that's my humble opinion. <laughs> Used to be that you only saw them in South Florida. Uh, we, I saw maybe 30 of them at um, Big Talibut Island maybe six months ago. So that is a direct result. You're seeing birds migrate in ways that are not normal. And there are concerns about that. Like I love seeing roseate spoonbills, but if they are migrating early because of temperature changes, where are they feeding? Like what happens when they get to their natural feeding grounds and the food isn't there yet? Like our plants are blooming at weird times. So what's happening to the rest of the ecosystem in response to that? Um, I see people all the time, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe the sea turtles are here and it's only February. It's like, I can't believe the sea turtles are here and it's only February. So there are concerns, love seeing them, but we're always thinking about like what is causing these changes and what are the long-term impacts? Yeah. It's my understanding. So the question is about um, seeing white pelicans within our, our waterways and our watershed. Uh, again, I've only been at the reserve for seven years and we've always kind of seen a smattering of white pelicans on occasion. Um, see, and I think we're starting to see more similar to the roseate spoonbills, but I will tell you outside of um, eBird, uh, and iNaturalist, that's where most of our bird monitoring is happening. So we have a group of volunteer birders that four o'clock in the morning, they are waiting to get out on the trails. And I follow them on St. Augustine Birding on Facebook. They are constantly posting photos of new birds that are coming into the area. It's amazing like to see when they show up and you could see I'll meet you in 10 minutes and they're all running to go see this bird. I'm, I'm a novice birder, so I get that excitement. Um, but that's really how we're finding out that information. Now, if we have a researcher from the Netherlands that requests uh, to conduct research within our boundary, if it helps us achieve the GTM mission to understand the biodiversity, um, they are authorized to conduct research within our boundary. So that's a big portion of our programs is visiting investigators coming in from all over the world to conduct research within the boundaries. Uh, so if somebody came in and wanted to talk about birds, I think we would be all over that because so many of them are um, keystone species. You know, I could talk about this stuff all day, but does anybody have any other questions? With that, I have one last thing to put out there to you. And this was something that Laura and I were talking about right before uh, my presentation. We recently got back the, um, the president's proposed budget for 2024. And it looks like the NERS system, um, they've kept that budget flat and they've reduced our construction budget despite the fact that we are tasked to build two more reserves in the country. Um, if you are so inclined, please reach out to your representatives and ask them to approve the funding at the levels requested because this is a good, solid program. I don't work for GTM. I am the outsider that watches what they do with the money. They are extraordinarily good stewards of the taxpayer dollars, even the donor dollars. I'm like, guys, you don't have to use a plastic cup. Can we maybe get you something else to take the water samples? Like they're just really frugal with those dollars. And I cannot see a world where an increase in funding to the nurse system would be money poorly spent. So if that is something that you're passionate about, um, please let me know and I'll provide you the information you need. In this case, you were talking about Senator Rubio, Senator Scott, you're talking about Congressman Aaron Bean and Congressman John Morgan. Correct. Uh, national Correct. Thank you so much for that clarification. And thank you all for inviting me to be here. I really appreciate your time. If you have any questions, you know where to find me.